Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice, and this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. And now a word from this week's sponsor, Laurel Road. Taking out med school loans had me watching every penny. I took two buses to get to campus. During my residency, I walked 20 blocks. But since I opened a Laurel Road link checking account when I refinanced my loans, I got a crazy low rate plus a cash bonus. And all that extra money helped me finally buy my own car. Where are we going? Anywhere we want. Laurel Road for Doctors. Banking insights and benefits uniquely designed for doctors. See laurelroad.com slash doctor checking for full terms and conditions. Laurel Road is a brand of KeyBank NA member FDIC. Dr. Nina Shapiro, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. So was there a straw that broke the camel's back either when you were talking to patients or maybe even your colleagues where you said, enough is enough. I've heard enough about this baloney. I need to write a book about it. You know, there was, and and a lot of people say, no, it was just something I was thinking about. But I will tell you, if you are thinking about writing a book, especially if you're in medicine, and even if you're not in medicine, it's an amazing process, but it is a long and arduous process. And it has to be done. I think when it's not that you want to write a book, you feel like you have to write a book. And that's how it was for me. I really genuinely, and this is a true story, I felt like I had to write this book. And I do remember that aha moment. And and again, I live and work in Los Angeles, which is the center of the world for woo and pseudoscience and a lot of made up wellness and medicine that really is just uh, fake stuff. Um, surrounded by that. And I did think about writing a book based on just living and working here, but I remember the day it was a week where a pediatrician called me and said, I have this 15 month old patient and he's having some trouble breathing. He's coughing. He's been coughing for about a month. And when I took a listen to his chest today, he was wheezing on one side. And this is a very good pediatrician. And she said, you know, you don't have asthma on one side of your chest. And it didn't really seem like he had pneumonia. So she wanted to get a chest X-ray on the patient. And the family said, oh, we don't want our, our little baby, our untainted child to be radiated with the chest X-ray. It's too interventional. It's too invasive. Finally convinced well, wait that- Wait till you hear about what happens next. <laughs> exactly. After the radiation. That's the yeah. least of it. So finally she convinced him to get an X-ray. It showed what we call air trapping, which means that there is a foreign object lodged in the patient's airways. It had probably been there for four to six weeks. And it turned out that he had been eating cashews about a month and a half prior and choked on a cashew. And remember, this is a 15 month old. These kids are barely walking. Let Gumming alone cashews. Yeah. Eating solids with their three-year-old brother who also shouldn't have been eating cashews. So finally, they she convinced them to see me, a surgeon, which just sounds terrible. I saw him in the office and I said, you know, guys, this guy, this kid needs a surgery yesterday or actually six weeks ago. They didn't want to have surgery. And, you know, it was really to convince them to come to the operating room because surgery was so interventional and so invasive. Can't you get it out another way? No, I can't. We can either do what's called a thoracotomy. His feet? What other? Yeah, thoracotomy. That's the other way. Yeah, we can yeah, make like slap well, I think people- on the back. When they hear surgery, they assume incisions. So sometimes that right, can be the scary right. part because, right, you're not. You're you're just reaching in. You just he won't let you if he's awake. Exactly, that would be pretty tricky. And you know, they also and we also think of the surgery as the last resort. You know, we're sort of you know the end game to everything else that they've tried. And there's really nothing else you can do when it comes to a foreign object in a child's airway. So finally, convinced him to have surgery. During the surgery, the kid had a very, let's just say a very difficult time because his only one lung was functioning. The other lung was starting to fill up. So he had very little reserve and it was a very dicey intervention. All's well that ends well. The child is now, you know, probably in in first or second grade doing great, probably still eating cashews. 
<laughs> and, you know, when we were all sort of sighing and, and stressed out and, you know, we got the kid through it and he was in the ICU and, you know, the anesthesia team was amazing, great surgery team, the whole, the whole nine yards. I said to the parents, you know, all is well, um, but we really need to talk about, you know, the safety of and not safety of eating foods like nuts. That's all I said. Um, he's 15 months and probably his three-year-old too really shouldn't, they're, they're too young to be eating nuts. And the family said, well, we're vegan and nuts are organic and have protein. So we're going to continue to do that. Thank you. And, you know, well, I, I will, hopefully <laughs> I won't be on call the next time that this exactly. happens. So one of my colleagues can deal with one of these. Yeah, what could right. you compromise like cashew butter? Cashew, cashew, guys, and cashew I, butter. I talked to them about yeah. nut butter and all that. Anyway, hopefully yeah. they understood because the kid yeah. was in the ICU for a day or two. He was quite sick. Um, but the point was at that moment, I said, you know, here's this family. They're educated. They're lovely. They, all they want is the best for their children. And, um, you know, and they said it really with care and they weren't being dismissive of me and they weren't being, um, you know, uncaring and the concern for their child, but they completely missed the boat on what is safe and healthy and what is dangerous. And that whole sort of mixed understanding of risk and danger and safety and health and well-being is completely turned upside down. And I, at that moment, I remember that afternoon, I said, that's it. This is going to be done. And it was. So this is a this is a patient facing book, right? But still, I mean, there's a lot of important stuff for for physicians as well. So when you were writing this book, I would imagine you ended up taking a different approach towards communicating with people like this, right? Communicating with people that that but that's not really pseudoscience, right? That that wasn't um, that's kind of hype, yes, because like you have this leaf of kale on the on the cover of your yeah. very California right. and, the, and the vegan, right? Um, but but like we we're put in situations with patients where they have these beliefs in pseudoscience, right? And for instance, ear pain, right? Kid kid gets recurring ear infections, right? Your pediatric otolaryngologist, so um, you're you're going to be seeing a lot of this and. The parents come in and they've been giving their kid homeopathic eardrops. Now, they don't work for Gwyneth Paltrow's goop, right? They're not like, but they just, they're doing what they thought was the right thing. They're not like, you know, taking their kids to naturopathic doctors. They're not that, let's just say it's a family. They just, my kid's in pain. The drop said ear pain. How do you talk to them about that because I haven't found an effective way that doesn't make me sound like some hoity toity. Like, let me explain to you what homeopathy is, right? You're dilution, and then there's nothing left of the actual substance. And right, I feel like I've lost them. So, what, how does your, right. how do your conversations go? Right. So, as you said, you know, if we start to sort of minimize what our patients are doing for their families, especially if they're well meaning, um, we've lost them. If we say, you know, what are you crazy or what are you thinking or how would you possibly do that or who told you to do that, they're gone, they're done. What I try to do is a couple of things. One thing that I learned from one of my very early mentors, uh, we called him Monty, William Montgomery. He said, Nina, I always like to treat my patients like they're a neighbor. Not necessarily a friend neighbor, but just a neighbor. They're not family, they're not friends but the way you would talk to a neighbor. So on that level, so it's more as if this is the problem over here and we, the doctor and the family or the patient are going to try to attack or address that problem as opposed to I'm over here, you're over here, I'm right, you're wrong, let me tell you what to do. Um, and so, even if we know what we're doing and they and we know clearly that they don't know what they're doing, they have to be part of the conversation and part of the process. So if it's something that's useless, like something homeopathic in the ear, and they don't have, say, ear tubes or a perforation or having had ear surgery, it's not going to do anything bad. It's not going to do anything good, but it's certainly harmless. So I don't really dwell on things that are useless. Um, if it's very, very costly, 
to the family, then I'm a little more forthright of, wow, you know, that's, that's something that you really don't need to be spending $400 on for that one, you know, little CC of golden drops that you've bought. Um, so, you know, if they have that, I'll, you know, first of all, I'll say, well, how is it helping? And maybe it is. And maybe they don't really have otitis and maybe they don't have anything. And it just, the drops make them feel better. And then I can say, great, the ear is clear. Um, I don't know if it was the drops that helped them. It probably wasn't, you know, so sort of, just to sort of involve them in the process as opposed to just what? that's crazy, or that's just so wrong, because then, then they're gone. And we have a lot of families here and probably all over the country that have different ideas than, than what we would consider traditional. And, um, and, and we have to kind of go with it a little bit. So I'll sometimes, ask, I'll sometimes ask, do you know what homeopathy is? You bought homeopathic drops. And they'll say, no. And then I'll educate them and it never works out so what you're saying from what you talk to patients about is you don't even go there you're like did it help great could have been could have been the drops could have not but you don't dwell on that one even though you wrote this book this book on hype you have chosen not to fight that fight because with all the information that you're giving the patient that is not so important Right. i mean i give them my recommendations and if they say well the next time this happens do you suggest that we use it again? Um, then I would say, well, the next time it happens, you should see your pediatrician, not me. So I don't want to see every kid with an earache um, and, and see if there is. I do. My practice is a bit different than you. OK, so but I, right. Yeah. But you, okay, you can see them. And then if there's something actually going on, um, I'm happy to see your pain. Um, but, uh, you know, then I would say, well, maybe, you know, we should evaluate it at the time to see if that is really the right direction to go. Um, and then sometimes if, if families say, um, this is what I always do when my child has X, Y or Z, um, and then, then I, what I oftentimes do, and, it, and it's really hard, it's a fine line, but if you do it in a way that's respectful, um, you can get a good conversation going. You know, if a patient uses something, you know, say homeopathy of any sort, whether it's an eardrop or a nasal spray or, you know, a, a so-called antibiotic that's not, um, then I'll say, well, I'm, I'm curious to see if you have any more information about that or if there's been any data on that, you know, depending on their, their interest level and their understanding of scientific research, um, as opposed to just saying it doesn't exist and it's, and it's nonsense. Um, I, I try to engage them and then I just sort of, and then I say, well, here's what I recommend and here are the national guidelines from our national societies in our specialties, whether it's pediatric or ENT, um, here's what we currently recommend and here are the national guidelines. And sometimes if you say something like that, as opposed to, well, the study of 400,000 children over the last 4 million years showed this, um, that's, I think, less approachable than here's what we recommend. So a perfect example is, um, you know, my child has fluid in their ears. It's not infected, but I want to clean it up with antibiotics. Um, which is, is commonly done. And, and uh, you know, we physicians are a lot at fault for giving this misinformation to families. Um, and, you know, so then I'll explain it to them. Well, here's, here's what we're recommending right now and here's why. And here's the potential harm for some of these other interventions. So it sounds like mostly focusing on the positive. So rather than like saying like, this is why your thing didn't work. What you're saying is, this is what I recommend this is the physiology, this is why it works, and, and then you go from this. So you're really spinning it on the positive rather than focusing on what they shouldn't do, unless what they're doing is harmful, right? Putting those drops in, in a kid with ear tubes could potentially cause some ototoxicity or at least middle ear inflammation. Um, but but um, if it's gonna be harmless, then just leave it alone and then explain why your recommendation is the, is the way to go. So focusing more on that. So, and I think that that keeps patients more, um, uh, 
understanding. I think they understand it more. And I think they are less sort of offended because if, you know, if you think about it, you know, if I brought my car in and I know nothing about cars and I said, well, you know, I think it's this part here that's making the noise. And, you know, if the car guy says, you idiot, you know, what are you thinking? This has nothing to do with that. I'm not going to go back to him. Right. It was making a noise. So I put oil in. Here's the oil. And they're <laughs> exactly. like, that. you put the oil in the wrong part. Those, that's ridiculous. That's not all wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. And I have, so. I mean, I have, you know, I just take care of kids and I have so many parents who are so anxious and, you know, they feel so terrible if they do something wrong for the most part. So for instance, I had a kid who, you know, had some odoria, you know, some ear drainage after tubes. And the parents, and this is this has happened, and I'm sure you've seen this too. They use either, you know, a swimmer's ear drop or vinegar, and the kid oh. hits. And I always tell them, yeah. you know, you'll do that once because yeah. the kid, your your kid is going to scream and hit the ceiling. Yeah. And then these parents call, and I'm like, you did not break them. You did not break your child. Don't worry, they're fixed. It's fine. You learned your lesson once. Don't do it again. And it's fine. Get over yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, we make so many mistakes as parents and, and the, the last thing they need is to, you know, for us to beat them up more. So I've gotten a little softer, maybe since the book is kind of rough in many ways, it's a little cynical, has a lot of sarcasm in it. Um, it's meant for, you know, the non-medical and the medical audience, cause it covers a lot of areas. Um, but just in my day to day, I, you know, I, I try to, I try to give, give parents a little bit of slack these days. I don't know what came over me. <laughs> So, so how do you respond when a patient tells you something that their doctor recommended, right? And for you, like you're getting referrals from other otolaryngologists and you're getting referrals from family, uh, family medicine, pediatrics. So if their trusted physician who they have a relationship with tells them something that you know is, is incorrect and not just incorrect, but like based in pseudoscience, right? Like, oh, every time my kid gets sick, I give them vitamin C because Dr. So-and-so told me to, or I give them Zycam, or I give them, um, how do you how do you approach that? Because there's two, there are two fronts here. There's the patient, and then the, there's, there's the referring doctor. So how do you navigate that conversation without alienating both parties? That is a little bit tricky. And as you know, as you know, we are, you know, based on referrals, from physicians and from, you know, word of mouth and from families. Um, again, unless it's truly dangerous, and there, there are very few physicians out there who are really dangerous. Um, if, if a physician is doing something like, you There's know, even get, for Senate right now, who's pretty dangerous, but that's a different, that's a, uh, no, that's a whole yeah, other whole podcast. Get him on your podcast. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, yeah, no, he, who, who shall not be named. Um, uh, so, you know, if it's something like, you know, a lot of kids, a lot of patients that I see, you know, their pediatrician or primary care doctor gives them antibiotics for every cold. I think that's, that's incorrect. I think that's not good medicine. And, um, you know, in some ways more harmful than giving, you know, 2000 milligrams of vitamin C, which is going to do nothing, maybe give them kidney stones if they do it every day. Um, so, uh, again, for that, uh, unless I think it's really dangerous, I just tell them, well, here's what I recommend. And here's what a lot of people recommend. And here's what, here's the way, um, and here's what it's based on. And here's why. And then I would maybe give them some soft, not, you know, not soft data, but data in a way that's not like, well, a study showed this, but you know, again, going back to guidelines, I feel like guidelines are our enemy and guidelines are our best friend. Because, you know, for us as practitioners, we have to keep up with the changing guidelines. But it does give us a little bit of support when we're doing something that is potentially different from, say, five years ago, 10 years ago, or even two years ago. So, you know, if I have a patient who's having their tonsils out, and the parents are pretty insistent on having antibiotics postoperatively, and then I can say, well, actually, the new recommendations based on a lot of years shows that antibiotics can actually do more harm than good. And once you say that, um, you know, they'll usually go for it. Um, but when it's another practitioner, and again, you know, I live in a big city, as, as do you, and, you know, Los Angeles is a big county, big city. Um, there are 10 million people in Los Angeles County. Uh, if it's, you know, and there are a lot of doctors practice differently, uh, 
I just tell them the way I do it and why. And, you know, I don't, I don't like to doctor bash. Um, I think, I think people know when they meet a different doctor and they have different philosophy or different way of practicing. And, and, you know, for many people, uh, certainly people who have those options, uh, they make their choice and they'll get different, they'll get different care wherever they go. Is there anything that you, and I apologize, this is not exactly in the questions that, uh, that I sent you before, but is there, is there something that you've seen in a lot of the community physicians that end up referring your patients? Like this is your opportunity to give a mini talk on something that you would like to see them do a little bit differently. Maybe they're making some recommendations that you think or telling their patients something that you think they should be doing just a little differently. This is your opportunity to, uh, to, to talk to them. I would say one of the things that, I, that concerns me, and I, I mentioned it already, is that um, you know these infants and toddlers with quote unquote sinusitis, we see a lot of that, even in Southern California where the weather is beautiful every second. We see a lot of runny noses, stuffy noses. We didn't see it a lot during quarantine and COVID over the last two years, but we're seeing it again now with a vengeance. And these kids who have recurrent really just bad colds and sometimes even you know viral bronchitis, um, they're on antibiotics every couple of weeks. And then what do you know? They stop responding to antibiotics when they re never really did in the first place or they got better while on antibiotics, but it wasn't really the antibiotic. It was just the 10 days of recovery. So, you know, I wish that there were less use of antibiotics uh, out in the community. It's, you know, people come to the doctor and I remember this even as a, as an early intern and resident that, you know, in the ER, they always told us that when a person comes into the doctor's office, they want to leave with a parting gift. And that it usually is in the form of a It's not a birthday party. They don't get goodie bags. That's not they, how this works. They want that little piece of paper. And we don't have samples anymore. So we have to give them the actual prescription. And I remember we started prescribing um, this really cool, powerful medication called ibuprofen. And people didn't know that name. And so they would go to their, <laughs> you know, their pharmacy and get this prescription filled for ibuprofen. We're going to give you a really high dose, 200 milligrams. Um, because people, you know, wanted to leave with something. And, and, you know, now I think people want to leave with a prescription for an antibiotic. If they're going to take their child out of school, bring them to the doctor's office, they don't want to leave knowing that they're sick and they just have to get better. And it's just going to be a matter of time. And I try to really um, do that with a lot of patients is flip it into, you know, if I'm not going to give them anything, I'm not going to recommend surgery. I'm not going to recommend a medication. I'm really not going to recommend anything. And then they feel like, well, then what's the point? And I'll say, well, here's the good news. You don't need a surgery. You don't need medication. You just need time or X, Y, or Z. Um, so to give them that at least, because they want, they want something when they go to the doctor. I give them my business card and, and, a, and a sticker. <laughs> Um, if you're wondering uh, just how to diagnose a uh, sinus infection in a kid, you can listen to uh, a couple of a couple of episodes ago. We, we I had another pediatric otolaryngologist on from the Back Table ENT podcast, oh. and we talked about how you can. Um, yes, you were on you were on their podcast. I as love well. them. Yes, so we talked about how to diagnose a sinus infection in kids. So. If you want to, if you want to learn how to do that accurately to make sure you're not over prescribing, it is a hard thing to do. And we, you can't get it right. Hard to do it right. Even, even when we're doing nasal endoscopies, it's hard to get it right all the time. But, uh, um, but yeah, listen to that, listen to that episode. Um, so, okay. So when you're, when you're talking to, so we haven't really gotten much into, into hype, right? So far in this, um, um, in, in this episode. So when you do have, let's say like, an opportunity to talk to medical students um, and you want to cover on, you want to educate them some on some of the topics that you've covered in, in your book. What is it that you, t you know, you don't have them for much time, right? They're rotating through, they spend a day with you. If you want to give them a little nugget or two, what, what is it that you choose to, to pass on to them? Um, I think that for students and also for residents and even other physicians, what I try to talk to them about again is, is meeting their patients where they are because even if you hear some crazy stuff that patients are doing, you know, you don't want to alienate them um, and you want to educate them. So how do we do that in a way that's approachable? 
um, things to look out for, you know, sort of buzzwords are um, belief systems, you know, I, that I, I don't like that term. Do you, but you know, when a patient asks me and I really try to, I take a, I take a breath when they say that, do you believe in vaccines? And this was well before COVID, you know, this, they don't really ask me anymore because they know how I feel at this point. Um, but, you know, do you believe in vaccines as if it's the Easter Bunny or, or Santa Claus? Um, so, so for that, then I do, then I become a little clearer and, and a little more forceful. And I say, it's not a belief. This is the reality. This is how vaccines work. This is what they do. This is how they protect you. This is how they protect the community. Again, and this has nothing to do with COVID. This is all well, well, well before COVID. So vaccines are a biggie and vaccines are a biggie certainly in California, you know, mostly in Los Angeles, um, where there are a lot of families who are, you know, what we call anti-vax, but anti-vax has been a lot around as long as vaccines have been around. So, you know, that's yeah, a this big crazy topic. political yes. like juxtaposition of where like the far left and the far right end up meeting, right? Because now right. the far right, right don't believe in the vaccine and the far left was, was already like, I think like Marin County is one of the least vaccinated counties because, you know, of, of, of what you said, right there, right. they just, right. they, I don't want to put something foreign into my body. It's got toxins in it. And it's so, yeah, I just, I just found that really interesting how these two, you know, they couldn't be further apart in their belief systems systems. And yet they, they, they agree flipped. in this. Yeah. Well, they flip. So, so the state with the highest childhood vaccine rate is Mississippi. Right. And it's one of the low, you know, I think it's like 15 percent of the state is vaccinated against covid, but 95 plus percent of children are vaccinated. That's and, you know, a place like Marin County is 95 plus percent are vaccinated against covid, but it has one of the lowest childhood vaccine rates in the country. Yeah, it's completely it's a, it's 180 That's and, so you bonkers. know, completely opposite political beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So uh, so. so one of the things that you talk about in your book is the curse of the original belief, right? Right. The curse of the yeah. original belief um, is, is that once you've bought into something, it's hard to, it's hard to change your mind ultimately. Right. Cause we, I think the reason is because we think we believe that we're good decision makers. So it was the right thing to do to vote for Donald Trump. Right. I'm not going to get too political on this, but it's too late. I already have, it was the right thing to do. So now because I'm a person that makes good decisions, I'm going to continue to support a lot of what he does because I have, I make good decisions and my decision was to vote for him. So it's the same idea behind the curse of the original belief. Like I have been doing this thing in my practice for a really long time. So it's going to be hard for me to admit that that hasn't been the right thing to do. So is there a curse of the original belief that was particularly difficult for you to let go of? There was, and it, you know, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And it's, it's sort of the idea, you know, Donald Trump, for instance, that if you believe that you voted for Donald Trump for the good reasons and the right reasons and anything he does that is not something, you, you know, that, you know, deep down in your heart now is not the right thing, you will, your, your original belief system will, will convince yourself that, well, it's actually okay because, so even though he's doing these terrible things or doing something that I know is not something I believe in, because I voted for him, I, I sort of owe it to myself that my belief owns me and I have to stick with that. Um, for us in, in medicine, you know, if you think about how we practice now in 2022 or how we practiced in 2020 or how we practiced in 1992, it's one of the greatest things about being in medicine is that it does change. And that, you know, what you learned as a resident and an intern and a medical student is very different from what you're doing now. And what you're doing now is going to be different from what you're going to do 10 or 15 years from now. And for many of us, especially surgeons, that's a hard thing to do. It's hard to change. Um, and most people who make big changes remember the day that they made that change. You know, I remember the day when I didn't ask the anesthesiologist for 25 milligrams per kilogram of ampicillin at the start of a tonsillectomy. And it wasn't too long ago. I won't tell you when, but it wasn't too, it was long. It, was, it should have been a long time ago. It wasn't that long ago. 
Um, and everyone looked at me like, what? And I said, yes, I'm an antibiotic steward and I'm going to fight antibiotic resistance starting this moment. Um, and, and it was hard and then it was, and then all's well that ends well. And, and then it just be, you know, and then it becomes incorporated. Um, so it, it's a little thing, but that was a big thing for me. It's the most common surgery I do. So it was, you know, the, the, the whole room kind of fell into silence when I said that. Is, is there any other hype that you think maybe maybe not in the operating room, maybe in your life that you that you I see um, a lot of hype. and then no that you yourself oh, that I... and then you had to, you know, change change your view. You know what? Well, I'm going to stop taking. I just go back to vitamin right. C. I'm going to stop vitamin taking C. vitamin C. Everywhere. Right. Well, here's the thing. I do things that I know are hype. And I still do them because I believe that the placebo effect works. And I feel that if I do something, for instance, take a daily vitamin C or take a multivitamin. You do. Sometimes. Okay. Only in the winter. <laughs> okay. In the California winter. Okay. <laughs> only on only on Tuesdays. Um, if I take something that I know is really, I'm going to be fine either way, but I psychologically feel better. I feel like I have a little more control of my morning if I take a, a multivitamin purely because it's part of my routine. Um, I think there's some benefit to that. And, and families ask me that, like, what do you, doctor, what do you think about multivitamins? Or what do you think about vitamins? And I do this in talks, you know, I have an audience and I'll, I'll, you know, raise your hand if you take more than seven supplements a day. And then I go, you know, seven, six, five, four. Um, and people do, you know, there are people out there who are taking seven, eight, nine supplements per day, um, or, you know, these hyper vitamins or these super, you know, charged vitamins and these so-called super foods. Um, as long as it's not dangerous and as long as they don't mind wasting, and I mean wasting their money, then by all means, if it makes them feel better, go ahead. It's, it does, it's, there's no physiologic benefit to it except up here in your head. And if that's enough, then do it. And that's okay. And we do have an episode uh, on the placebo effect, actually, on someone who researches oh, the placebo effect. So uh, for the listeners, if you want to hear about that, it was uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so, so is there anything that you've encountered that seems like hype, but then when you looked into it, it turns out it isn't hype? Like, I don't know, intermittent fasting or, or cold showers and Wim Hof or, or toothpaste, right? Anything that seemed like hype. Um, but turns out isn't. So intermittent fasting, there's, there's true. So cold shower, I would, I, I don't care how good cold showers are for you. I don't care those ice baths. I see people, I see doctors, jump, you know, sitting in a steam bath and then jumping. I don't care. That's crazy. Um, I feel, you know, my heart starts racing when I see that. Um, so maybe it's good, but I don't, I don't even want to know. Um, we but, just opened the pool. So I do it. I do it once a year when we once open, a year. When we open the pool. Like, and, and then like, why yeah. you feel better? You feel better no. because you know, it's going to be summer soon. Right. And no, it's cause my kids peer easy. pressure me and my wife peer pressures me into doing it. They're like, dad, once, dad, and, right. then, and then they jump in. And so it's, a, it's and then it's, it's fun. fun. I, That's fun. Yeah, I think actually for that, it's, it's more like you prove to yourself that you can do hard things. So it's right, not necessarily the physiology of it, right. but like I take cold showers. Cold showers suck, but I can get myself to do it. Right. If, if I can get myself to do that, I can get myself to do this. So I think psychologically, but but so you so are you going towards intermittent fasting? There's some uh... there's some physiology to that. And uh it, you know, first of all, when I first heard of that, I said, Well, I do intermittent fasting every day and I break it. It's called breakfast. And that's it, usually six o'clock in the morning before I go to work. Um, but it, you know, there is some physiology to extending that period of time to, you know, and it depends on your age and your health status. There's so much to it. Um, but, you know, say if you normally, you know, finish dinner at seven at night and you wake up and you have dinner, you have breakfast at seven in the morning, but, and then you extend that to say, instead of your first eating at, you know, seven, instead you eat at 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning as your first meal, um, it will change your metabolism and potentially, help you lose weight or feel better. So from the basic, pure physiologic standpoint, there is something to intermittent fasting. That said, I, I remember um, 
last January or whenever our, the first vaccines came out and I was a vaccine, a vaccinator, a volunteer during that first month when we were rolling out vaccines and we were outside and sticking you know, needles in people's arms and while they were driving in cars and I was working with a, a doctor alongside me and it was about 11 in the morning and he said, um, I need to go get a cookie. I said, okay, go get a cookie. And, uh, and he said, because I haven't eaten today. And I said, well, then definitely go get a cookie. And he said, I'm, I'm doing intermittent fasting and I haven't eaten in whatever, you know, 18 hours or something like that. And I, and I thought, well, I mean, that just sounds terrible. First of all, you're starving. <laughs> Second of all, like you're, you're eating a cookie and it wasn't yeah, even like, gonna a, break your fast, a healthy, like, like a healthy be. cookie. Like you should be eating, <laughs> eating crap, if I can say that on your podcast. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, eat something healthy if you're going to do that to yourself or for yourself. So, you know, then I thought, well, there, there, there's more hype to reality in this intermittent fasting because people make their own rules, which is fine. But, you know, if, if I'm if I'm going to be doing something for health reasons and, you know, I'm starving and I'm going to eat a cookie, chances are I'm going to eat another cookie 10 minutes later. And um, it's certainly not going to help my health or my weight loss or or anything like that. But from a basic physiology standpoint, if you do wait to eat, um, there is some health benefit to it. But I'm not recommending it necessarily for everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it, it's funny. I find diet to be like religion. You know, people have these strong beliefs, but at the same time, like, like how we keep kosher in my house, like we just keep kosher in the house and the backyard, but like we eat, we can eat bacon and shellfish at a restaurant and we can mix milk with poultry because, but, so we've chosen right. to like, you, you know, so we've got this like belief yeah. Yeah. that this is the right thing for us to do but we're going to give a little here and we'll get over there. And that right, I right. think diet's the same thing, but also in the same way that people are so strong about their convictions with it. Like right. this is the, this is the right way and everything else is the wrong way. And it's right. just, and I think that's, that gets to some of the hype. Like it ends up right. you getting so fired up about so how, how, how vital it is. And ultimately like, you're right. It works for some people. There's some physiology behind it, but ultimately, Right. Like, and, and a lot right. of this stuff is just not for sustainable. You, it, you yeah. know, if you're, you know, people do it for a period of time and then, and then, oops, one day they wake up and they're hungry and they eat and then it's over. Um, and, and that's fine too. And just like keeping kosher or, you know, any sort of dietary restriction, unless there's a medical indication for it, you know, if you really have, you know, celiac disease and you can't have gluten or makes you really sick. Um, or, you know, if you keep, you know, kosher, for, for instance, um, and, but you live in a community where it's really hard to keep kosher because your kids' friends and colleagues, and then they start going to birthday parties and you're going out to restaurants where there's not good, you, you know, sometimes it's not sustainable. And then people make their own rules, which is fine. Um, but it does become, you know, a bit of a battleground. I find it very interesting. And whenever I talk about diet and I always say, well, you know, everything in moderation, People feel like that's a big cop out, but it's but it's the reality. Unless you have a medical indication or a very very strong religious conviction um, that I respect and appreciate, other than that, there is no evil food and there is no perfect food. There's no perfect diet and there's no t one terrible diet. And and people don't like to hear that because they want sort of well, what's the magic pill? What's the answer? And to say oh, a little of this, a little of that. Um, it's not so exciting. One, one of my, one of my first podcast interviews with, with, uh, Stephanie Sog, who we had back recently, we talk about, we talk about weight, um, and how to talk to our patients about weight, how to have an effective conversation. And what she says is food is not bad unless it's poisonous, it tastes bad, or, um, it's gone bad and then don't eat it. Right. If it's any of those three things, don't eat it. If everything else, it's, it's not bad and go ahead right. and eat it. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. But people don't so, like to hear that they want they want sort of they want that prescription. It's like that piece of paper, you know, tell me the diet. What's the best diet? What's you know, what's the secret sauce or not secret sauce um, to make me, you know, the, the perfect being that I am meant to be. And uh, it's a little frustrating. Yeah. And whatever, like you said, it needs to be sustainable. Right. Even if you give them this magic bullet, you know, thing that they have to do, if it's going to totally turn their world upside down, then it's ultimately not going to work. They're not going to be, it's not sustainable. They can't do it. So it even doesn't matter what that thing is. 
if it's not sustainable. And if it's not, if it, and it's going to be something that's so small that it is going to be sustainable. What what kind of difference is it going to make? Because <laughs> right, it's so small. Right, so right. it's it's a bit of a paradox. They're looking for something that they're right. ultimately not going to be able to to do. Right. Very popular here still are juice cleanses. I don't know if that's all around the country, but you know whether it's a, a colonic cleanse or just you know a quote unquote juice cleanse, um, people genuinely feel like that rids them of all the evil humors um, in their body and probably the world. And uh, I find that one very very entertaining. My wife, my wife, uh, my wife does that sometimes. She'll go on. A, it's going to kickstart. I'm going to kickstart it right with a cleanse. I'm like. Okay. Go ahead. But Go ahead. right, like the back to what you were saying with the homeopathy eardrops, like the conversation that I have with you is very, it's like, great. Okay. Go ahead. As long as what you're doing isn't dangerous. That's great. fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. So you also mentioned colonics. So the last thing I want to ask about is coffee, right? The hype around coffee, because I feel like every other day there's a study coming out that talks about the health benefits of coffee. And I think that's because as a profession, we are all dependent on coffee. And so we're going to seek out studies that justify our dependence on coffee. So what do you think? Coffee, hype, and if you are drinking coffee, how do you, how do, you do you drink it uh, orally or, or the colonic route? Do you just you know put it right through your uh, sigmoid colon? There you go. So um, yes. I don't care what they say about coffee. I'm going to keep drinking coffee. Um, and, you know, I guess you can say the same thing about wine. Maybe we like wine too, because there are a lot of wine studies too. I think with every coffee study, there's a red wine study. Um, and, you know, I think, again, this is so boring that coffee is, is actually good for you in moderation. I think the coffee studies now are more about whether it should be one cup, one and a half cups. What do you mean by a cup? My cup is 20 ounces. Is that a cup or should it be two cups or three? three cups. I think that's really, we know coffee is good for you. We know that too much coffee is bad for you. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, will it be associated with longer life? Well, people who drink coffee regularly are probably drinking coffee because they're getting up and going to work and going to work is associated with longer life and using your brain and using your muscles and using your body and using socialization. So it's for a study like that, when we're, especially when it's a diet issue and I consider coffee part of your diet or wine, uh, which is part of your diet, it's too complex. I really think even though they, they tease this stuff apart, um, most people who are drinking coffee on a regular basis are drinking it because they like it and they're also drinking it because they need it. And it is an addictive drug, which is fine. It's a pretty safe addictive drug. And um, it's good for you in moderation. It's pretty simple. If you drink five or six cups of coffee every morning, it's not good for you. It's going to cause problems with your heart rate and your blood pressure. And you're gonna have to pee all the, all the time. And if you're a surgeon, that's really not a good arrangement. Um, so, I think there will continue to be coffee studies. And I agree. I think doctors do it because <laughs> we like coffee. Um, there is a podcast, um, Explore the Space. And the host, Mark Shapiro, who's not related to me, but is wonderful, um, has a whole like coffee thing going on um, on Med Twitter, if you want to check it out. Much, much, much more advanced than I can ever talk about coffee. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. We'll have to check it out. Well, yeah. Dr. Nita Shapiro, author of Hype, A Doctor's Guide to Medical Myths, Exaggerated Claims and Bad Advice, How to Tell What's Real and What's Not. How do we find you online and how do we find your other books as well? Because that hype is not even your most recent book. You just put out another book. So actually briefly tell us about that. Sure. So thanks. So first of all, um, I, um, you can find me online on Twitter at Dr. Nina Shapiro on Instagram at Dr. Nina Shapiro. My website is drninashapiro.com. Uh, Amazon obviously is the behemoth that carries all of my books. My most recent book is called The Ultimate Kid's Guide to Being Super Healthy. It is written for the audience of elementary school children and maybe early middle school children. And it is written to acknowledge them and empower them to understand what's going on with their health and with the world around them. And probably most importantly, why we grown ups are making them do all the things that we make them do. 
Well, it sounds perfect for my kids. I've got one about to start kindergarten and one about perfect. to start first grade. So uh, I will definitely <laughs> and I have to have you back on to talk about it. Yeah. Dr. Nina Shapiro, thanks so much for your time. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Brad. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.